uh, welcome everyone um, to a well, happy new year. And I uh, hope everyone uh, had a chance to, to have a little bit of a, a break. Um, uh, and now we're uh, we're back to it. So this is uh, this is the first uh, seminar of 2024. And our speaker today is Clemens Mullner from uh, the Vienna um, University of Technology. And he's going to speak to us about uh, synchronizing automatic sequences along Pietetsky Shapiro sequences. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Happy New Year from me as well. It's a great pleasure to give a talk here. And the official title um, is Synchronizing Automatic Sequences Along Piatetsky Shapiro Sequences, which is also the uh, title of the paper that this talk is based on. But also it's the part one to uh, the talk that's coming in two weeks by Jakub Konieczny about arithmetic subword complexity of automatic sequences. So um, as it seems, there are many big experts on automatic sequences here, but I will still uh, shortly recall what an automatic sequence is. And uh, to do so, first we need to define what an automaton is. And usually I do this in terms of the transition diagram. So uh, we have a finite set of states. Here we have one state X and one state Y. We have a finite input alphabet here, zero, one. We have a complete transition function, which means for every state, there is exactly one outgoing edge for every uh, digit zero, one here. So we have here one outgoing edge for zero and one outgoing edge for one. We have an initial state indicated by start and we have an output function. So here X is mapped to zero and Y is mapped to one. So this is a classical uh, deterministic finite automaton. And we can use this to assign a sequence to it. And to do so, we start with any integer n, say, for example, 22. We write uh, it in base 2. So here it's uh, 16 plus 4 plus 2. So in base 2, it's 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then we feed this uh, digital expansion into our automaton. So we start in our initial state. We read 1, 0, 1, 1. Zero, we end up in a state y, and y is mapped to one. And so we say our 22nd element of the sequence is one. And if we do this for uh, all integers, we get an infinite sequence, and that is then called an automatic sequence. And this is a very famous automatic sequence. This is the so called uh, Thu Morse sequence. And automatic sequences have attracted interest from lots of different areas of mathematics. So there are also a bunch of equivalent definitions for automatic sequences, and we'll just give you uh, a few of them. So if you're coming from computer science, uh, probably you've heard of it in terms of automata, uh, but you can translate it directly to uh, fixed points of substitutions of constant length. So uh, here we start with our state x, and under 0 it's mapped to x, and under 1 it's mapped to y, and this corresponds in our substitution world to x is mapped to xy. And uh, we get the same uh, sequence if we take the infinite fixed point of this uh, substitution starting with x, and then we apply this uh, coding, which corresponds to the output function here. So this. Uh, it's quite obvious how we go here from one to the other, but there are also not so obvious other character, uh, characterizations. So uh, one could also do it in terms of the uh, formal power series associated to an automatic sequence, uh, which for this talk is not really important. And uh, the other one is using uh, the k kernel of a sequence. And the k kernel of a sequence is just the uh, set of all uh, arithmetic subsequences of the original sequence with a uh, step size uh, being a power of k. And a sequence is k automatic if and only if the k kernel is finite. And this k 
corresponds to the size of the input alphabet here. So here it would be two, for example. Okay, so that's how you can define automatic sequences. And uh, why do we care about automatic sequences? And um, they are relatively easy to define. Um, one of the main reasons to define them in the first place was uh, that they are uh, that you can see them as um, the simplest way to uh, compute interesting sequences in the sense that uh, we take the base k expansion of an integer and the output can be computed with finite memory. And the finite memory uh, relates to the number of states that we have. So uh, coming from computer science, this is uh, what, uh, the simplest class of interesting sequences. So they are relatively easy to define, but still they are complex enough that interesting phenomena can appear. And I will touch on this subject later a bit more. And also uh, another important property for this talk in specific is uh, that every uh, subsequence of an automatic sequence along an arithmetic progression is again automatic. Okay, so this was a very quick uh, idea of what are automatic sequences and why could we care about them. So uh, as the title of the talk suggested, maybe I should tell you what a synchronizing automatic sequence is or a synchronizing automaton. And again, I will do this using an example. So for an automaton to be synchronizing means that we have a synchronizing word. And here this word is 010. And what does it mean that a word is synchronizing? It means uh, if we follow the transition, indicated by this word, then we end up in the same state no matter where we start. So here, for example, if we start in x, we follow 0, 1, 0, we end up in x. And from y, it's 0, 1, 0, we end up in x again. And from z, it's a 0, 1, 0, so we end up in x again. And uh, you might have the impression that this is actually very restrictive. And in some sense, this is true. And in some sense, it's not. So uh, for example, if you take a random complete uh, automaton uh, with n states, then the probability that it is not synchronizing decreases uh, with uh, up to a constant uh, 1 over n. So in some sense, for an automaton to be synchronizing is the usual case. OK, what are now uh, some of the key properties for synchronizing automata? And uh, the first one, which is not very hard to see at all, if we take any word w that contains our synchronizing word w0, then this word is again synchronizing. And as a direct consequence of this observation, we see that most words are synchronizing. So if we take very long words, then the probability that at some point in this word, if it's randomly chosen, that some certain subword appears is uh, relatively high. It's just uh, counting numbers with a missing, missing digit kind of approach. And this is a, has a very interesting consequence, namely that uh, if we have a synchronizing automatic sequence, we can approximate it uh, with per using periodic sequences. So again, if we take uh, lambda large enough, then most words of length lambda contain our uh, synchronizing word w0. So they are then most of them are again synchronizing. So uh, we see that uh, a of n has to be the same as a of n if we just look at n modulo k to the lambda. If n modulo k to the lambda is synchronizing. And this sequence here is, of course, k to the lambda periodic. 
So uh, the one quite common strategy, how you get uh, results for synchronizing automatic sequences is first you start by uh, studying the problem for periodic sequences instead of synchronizing automatic sequences, which is usually relatively easy. And then you need to transfer this result to uh, synchronizing automatic sequences by a um, similar argument than what I've told you before. Okay, so that's now a quick overview over for synchronizing automatic sequences. And now to the second part of the Inofficial title, uh, the arithmetic subword complexity. So first, let me quickly remind you what the subword complexity of a sequence is. So we start with a se sequence over a finite alphabet A. And we say the subword complexity of a sequence uh, with parameter L is the number of words of uh, with size L that appear in our sequence at least once. And uh, of course, the trivial upper bound is uh, the size of the alphabet to the power of L. And if we take any random infinite sequence over an alphabet, we would expect it that every uh, possible word appears. So what, from, what we would expect from a random sequence is that uh, the subword complexity should look something like uh, A to the L. However, if we look at the subword complexity of automatic sequences, then the subword complexity actually grows linearly in L and not exponentially. So this is very, very slowly growing and also shows again that uh, automatic sequences are kind of simple in this sense. Okay, so now to arithmetic subword complexity. Um, so now, uh, again, we have a sequence over a finite alphabet A, and the arithmetic subword complexity is now the number of words of length L that appear along some arithmetic progression at least once. And this was introduced by, uh, I'm very sorry, I'm probably m mispronouncing the names horribly, uh, Avgustinovic, uh, von der Flas and Fried in 2003. And uh, they introduced this notion and they also uh, studied the arithmetic subword complexity for certain classes of automatic sequences. So on the one hand, they showed uh, that for uh, certain class of what I would call now invertible automatic sequences, uh, that they have maximal arithmetic subword complexity, so size of the alphabet to the power of L. And this covered uh, the Thumor sequence. So this is the one end of the spectrum what we could have. And on the other hand, they showed that for a certain class of synchronizing automatic sequences, namely a special class of tablet sequences, that uh, the arithmetic subword complexity grows at most linearly. So this is the complete opposite case. And um, already shows that it's somehow interesting to, it, that it could be interesting to study this notion for automatic sequences. And we also see that we can have very different uh, behavior from automatic sequences, depending how they look like. Okay. Um, but if we take uh, arithmetic progressions, we could also take this one step further. Um, we could take a polynomial subword complexity. So again, we have a sequence over a finite alphabet A and the polynomial uh, subword complexity of degree at most D is the number of words of length L that appear along uh, any polynomial with integer coefficients with degree at most D. 
And one of the main results of uh, the paper where the title is just the title of the talk, uh, together with uh, Jean-Marc Desoyer, Michael Trimutter, Andrei Schubin, and Lukas Spiegelhofer, we showed that if we take any synchronizing automatic sequence and d larger or equal to one, then this uh, polynomial subword complexity of the degree at most d grows sub-exponentially. So uh, the small o of L means just that the limit of uh, what we have here divided by L tends to zero. So for any epsilon larger than zero, this is smaller than epsilon L for L large enough. And of course, this is uh, not even closely uh, comparable to the results that I showed you on the slide before uh, for this uh, certain class of tablet sequences where it was growing linearly. Here, it's not even polynomial anymore, but it's still uh, sub-exponential. So we are still very far from uh, what we could have uh, as a maximum. And at the time, we didn't care too much about it. Uh, this small O of L could be made more precise and one could get uh, here something like a uh, constant times L to the one minus eta where eta is uh, small and positive. So it grows like a power of L, uh, but the power is smaller than one. Okay. Um, so in this context, this already seems kind of interesting and nice. But at the time uh, when we had this result, the main motivation was actually something different. Uh, this was uh, namely, we wanted to study the subword complexity of A of floor N to the C, where A is again synchronizing automatic. And here we have again the same upper bound. So it's again uh, sub-exponentially. And this n to the c was chosen. Uh, well, I mean, there were some reasons, but uh, actually, uh, we don't need uh, this particular form of it. Uh, we actually just need the derivatives of the function are nice, and I leave this wake here. What exactly this means, but for example, if you take um, functions from a Hardy field with polynomial growth, uh, where it's uh, stays away from an exact polynomial, uh, then you are also fine, for example. And uh, what I already promised for the talk in two weeks, uh, this was actually also used to get uh, relatively sharp upper bounds for the polynomial subword complexity for general automatic sequences. Okay, so... Um, this was now the story for synchronizing automatic sequences. I just quickly tell you uh, what can happen at the other end of uh, what's possible for automatic sequences. So uh, for the two more sequence, again, this is the prime candidate to look at because it's so well known and so easy to define. Uh, we know that if we look at the through more sequence along squares, so along a single polynomial, not many as before, but really just one single polynomial, then uh, every uh, block of length L appears. And not just that, uh, it appears with asymptotic density one over two to the L, which means it's normal. Um, so this now looks in this sense completely random, which is, completely different from what we know for synchronizing automatic sequences. And uh, yeah, the through more sequence is not incredibly special in this case. So this also holds for so-called block additive functions modulo M. Um, and don't be fooled that this one was published earlier than this one. 
Uh, the result by Tremota Modui and Reva was the basis of that it just took longer to be published. Um, so this paper just took the machinery developed here and applied it in this case as well. I mean, there are still things that one needs to prove, but the main ideas were in this paper. And uh, one can also study the Thumor sequence uh, along n to the c. And again, uh, this one here is normal if c is between 1 and 3 half. And this uh, bound of 3 half here and here that we only look at quadratic polynomials uh, does not mean that we would expect this to not hold for higher degrees polynomials, but it's just like the methods are not there yet to treat higher degree polynomials. Uh, recently, there was a breakthrough by Lukas Spiegelhofer where there are now first results about cubes, but still it seems that we are very far off from dealing with higher degree polynomials. Okay, so that's the uh, background to the results. And now I tell you how the proof of these results uh, work. And I apologize in advance that uh, that will probably be a bit technical at times. But at some point, there are also pictures. Um, so uh, I will start with the proof of uh, theorem one. Uh, and the naive approach that I've outlined before is, OK, first we look at a periodic function. So let's say uh, m periodic function, uh, then it's not very hard to see that the subword the polynomial subword complexity with degree at most d of length l is bounded by m to the d plus one, and this is simply due to the fact that uh, if we have a polynomial of degree d, uh, then we have uh, d plus one coefficients, and uh, we only care what the residue modulo m is. So we have m choices d plus 1 times, so the bound is m to the d plus 1. So uh, then, uh, as I told you before, we can approximate uh, the synchronizing automatic sequence a of n by a k to the lambda periodic function, which I just call f of n here for simplicity. And if lambda is large enough, then we know that a of n and f of n agree on most residue classes modulo k to the lambda. However, now we run into a problem because uh, we have we want to work with any polynomial of degree e d. So we could have the situation that p only uh, falls into uh, bad residue classes that are not synchronizing. So as a trivial example, we could just take the polynomial p of x is k to the lambda x plus r. So modulo k to the lambda, we always have residue r. And if r is not synchronizing, then uh, a of n and f of n don't have anything in common. And we can't translate it at all. OK, so the naive approach fails, which is uh, uh, not so good in some sense, but also then we have uh, something to prove that's interesting. And first, I will just start with some technical reductions um, very quickly. So uh, we want to study uh, subwords of lengths L of A of P of N. So we want to study D subwords here. And as a first step, we can just say, OK, we define Q of L as uh, P shifted by L uh, by N. So that, uh, and this is again a polynomial with integer coefficients. So we study A of Q of L. And now we don't have to shift by N, but we start at position 0 up to L minus 1. And um, next, we try to avoid this trivial problem that we had that I showed you on the previous slide. So uh, we define uh, lambda zero to be the largest integer such that k to the lambda zero divides all the 
coefficients that are not the constant coefficient. And then we can just factor it out. And for the constant coefficient, we also could have a residue. And this means now, of course, that one of these coefficients here is not divisible by k. So in some sense, we have uh, avoided the trivial problem that we had before. And now, if you remember the definition of the kernel, this is now really uh, an element of the kernel. So if we take uh, the subsequence along uh, k to the lambda 0 plus r, then we see that this belongs to the k kernel that we had defined before. So we can write a of q of l as now bi, where bi is an element of the finite kernel, uh, along a new polynomial q prime of l. And we know that one of the non-constant coefficients here is now um, not divisible by k. And it's not very hard to see that if uh, our original A is synchronizing, then our BI is again synchronizing. So we have reduced the problem now to study uh, BI of Q prime of L, uh, where we have one now that we don't have this shift by N that we had before. Um, and we have that one of the coefficients, it's not divisible by k. And we've traded off that instead of looking at our original sequence a, now we look at one of the elements of the kernel, but it's still synchronizing. So it doesn't change the situation too much. OK. Um, so in some sense, we have now avoided the, the trivial problem, but still we are by no means out of the woods yet. Uh, because if we just look at, I'll just give you an example here where uh, the polynomial is five times three to the four times L modulo six to the four. So our K here is six and our Lambda is four. So um, now we study uh, the digital expansion of the values of this polynomial and um, we see this coefficient here is not divisible by two. So in particular, it's not divisible by K, which is six in this case. So we are actually in the case that we care about. So now we see that uh, actually we have quite a few different residues here, which is good, but also the bad news is uh, these residues uh, modulo K to the under, so just the last four uh, digits here, uh, they repeat uh, after already 16 elements. So every block of these four digits here appears um, 81 times. So this means we still hit the residue classes modulo k to the lambda very often and very concentrated. So this means that uh, this Q prime of L can still only hit very few residue classes. And we know that there are few examples that are not synchronizing. So just comparing the sizes doesn't help anymore. We really need to do something more clever. And naively you could say, okay, well, we just need to find the synchronizing word at some position. So for example, we could look at the least significant digits but here the situation is uh, even worse. So if we just look at the last two digits, we see that there are only four different blocks that appear. So there is no, again, no chance to make sure that the synchronizing word appears at this position. But the good news is if we look at the high digits, so here the, uh, at the fourth position, uh, we actually see that uh, every possible digit, so zero, up to five, here appears exactly twice or three times. So here the high digits are really well distributed, uh, uh, appear as often as we expect them to appear. Okay, so here I just uh, 
uh, recap what I told you before. So the remaining problem is that we still only hit few residue classes modulo k to the lambda by the example that I showed you before. And the low digits don't help at all, but the high digits really work. And what one can prove is that uh, if lambda grows to infinity, we can fix a certain uh, proportion of these lambda digits, namely epsilon times lambda of these digits. And then we have uh, that this block at this position, every block appears as often as we expect it to. And uh, as lambda grows to infinity, epsilon lambda also grows to infinity. So also most of these blocks are synchronizing. So in this case, we recaptured that almost every uh, residue that we hit is synchronizing. Okay, uh, just a quick uh, detour telling you how one could prove that uh, uh, the high digits appear as often as we expect them to appear. And this is coming from analytic number theory. So I'll just give you a very quick overview with very rough ideas. So if we want to detect the digits of L in base K between mu and lambda, uh, then they are the same digits as M. If uh, the fractional part of L divided by K to lambda belongs to a certain interval here. And uh, here, the fractional part of this real number is just you take the uh, expansion uh, with the digits higher than the decimal point, decimal point, lower ones, and you throw away the higher ones. So you just take the fractional part, which is between 0 and 1. And uh, we want to count how many of these, uh, how often we have this certain uh, word here at positions uh, between mu and lambda. And to do so, we take this indicator function here. We expand it in a Fourier series. And for h equals 0, we get the main term. And for h not 0, uh, we want to uh, use, we want to show that this is small. And this can be done using classical estimates for these uh, uh, exponential sums. And this estimate uh, depends on the GCD of the coefficient of the non-constant coefficient with k to the lambda. So this is now also the place where we use the fact that uh, one of the coefficients is not divisible by k. This gives us the saving in the end. OK, that was just a quick detour. Uh, how one could detect uh, digits using analytic methods. So just uh, recapping how the proof now works for the uh, arithmetic subword complexity. So uh, from the point where we had the reductions, so we look at uh, bi of q prime of L. And as a first step, we approximate bi by a k to the lambda periodic function f of n just as I told you in the beginning for synchronizing automatic sequences. And we know that these two uh, don't coincide only when Q prime of L modulo K to the lambda is not synchronizing. And since the high digits of Q prime of L distribute uniformly, this happens rarely. So out of this L, um, so since small l goes up to capital L, the proportion grows like k to the minus epsilon lambda. So it decreases when lambda gets larger. And now if we want to look at the subword complexity of bi of q prime of L, we say, well, uh, all the possible subwords that uh, can appear come from this word f of q prime of lambda, where f is uh, k to the lambda periodic. So there are only very few of these words. And then we change a small proportion of the numbers. And uh, if you work out the details, this already uh, 
shows you that you start with a few possible sequences where you change only a few places. So still the total number is small. And uh, what we didn't do in the paper, but what's not very difficult is you can optimize Lambda as a function of L. So you have here uh, different effects. So if Lambda increases, then this here becomes larger, but the uh, proportion on which they uh, disagree becomes smaller. So there is some optimization to be done. Okay, so these were the main ideas how to prove uh, theorem one. And uh, for theorem two, now there are uh, some pictures soon, I promise. Um, so just uh, recapping what we want to do. Again, we take any synchronizing automatic sequence and we want to study the subword complexity of A along floor N to the C. And uh, the first thing that we do is uh, we expand N plus L to the C as a Taylor polynomial of degree D where D is a uh, floor of C which guarantees that the error term that we have is small. So we can just write this as a polynomial plus an error term. So you already have might have the impression that this could be somewhat useful that we have already proved theorem one. However, the big problem why we can't directly uh, use this is here our coefficients are now real numbers and not uh, integers anymore. So there's still some work to be done. And again, we follow the same strategy as always for synchronizing automatic sequences. Uh, first, we replace them by periodic functions. And as an initial step, uh, we ignore the error term that we have here. So we only look at the polynomial uh, instead of n to the c and a periodic function instead of uh, automatic sequence a. And if we have now an m periodic function, we want to detect when a uh, floor of p of l is uh, congruent to some ul modulo m. And we do this the same way that we uh, detected the digits before in an analytic way. Uh, this is now the same as saying, well, in base m, the first digit is ul. So we have the exactly same uh, thing that we had here. So the last digit is m if and only if this equation here holds. So uh, we want to detect this thing here. And as a first step, we expand the polynomial. And then we see that uh, a priori we wouldn't have these uh, fractional parts in here. But uh, if we take this and add an integer to it, multiply it again by an integer, we only change the integer part of this whole expression. And since we only care about the fractional part, we're allowed to take the fractional part of this expression here. And this helps now because the fractional part is always between 0 and 1. So. Uh, this whole expression here cannot be too large. Indeed, it can be bounded by uh, d plus one times L to the d, if uh, small l is at most capital L. So we can get rid of this outermost fractional part by just uh, adding an integer here. And after we've done this manipulation, uh, one might have forgotten already what we actually wanted to study. We wanted to study uh, how many different uh, ULs can appear uh, if we have here any, uh, any value for this A sub T. So we do this by saying, okay, uh, we just treat this as a variable and want to detect uh, what does it mean that uh, this sum of, uh, let's call this xt times l to the t belongs to this interval. And here there's now a really neat interpretation. 
because uh, if we just have uh, the sum of this polynomial is uh, a constant, then this actually is a hyperplane if we consider the xt to be variables. So in particular, this means that if we uh, take this uh, tuple x0, x1 up to xd as a point in the d plus one dimensional space, then this means that this point needs to be in between two parallel hyperplanes. And here I have uh, drawn some of these hyperplanes. So for example, uh, for L equals zero, we have just uh, X zero here. So this means that these are these hyperplanes here. For L equals one, we have these hyperplanes with slope minus 45 degrees. And for L equals two, we have these hyperplanes here with slope minus 30 degrees. And if uh, the tuple X zero, X one is in this region, this means that these inequalities hold here. And if I recall correctly, the ULs that correspond to this are U0 being one, U1 being one, and U2 being zero. So what we see is uh, every such region here uh, corresponds to one uh, choice of uh, ULs, so of this word u0 up to ul minus one. So this also means now if we can uh, estimate the number of regions that we have here, we can estimate the number of words u that uh, appear. And now if we just take a very rough estimate of how many hyperplanes there are, this was basically uh, what I told you before, then there are classical estimates for how many regions there are. And uh, the number of regions is now m to the d plus one and l to some other power. So this shows us that uh, we have that uh, the support complexity of, uh, not support complexity, but the number of uh, words that can appear along any polynomial with uh, real coefficients, modulo m, uh, this is actually bounded by a polynomial in L. So we still have very small growth. So it's just polynomial in L. Um, OK, so what happens now if we introduce back the error term? Well, in fact, nothing too interesting happens, I mean, still interesting, but it doesn't change the picture very much because uh, this was our original polynomial and then we have our error term. So uh, now we just uh, shift this error term into the hyperplanes, which means that uh, we shift all the hyperplanes. And here I have computed uh, how these shifted hyperplanes look like. I think it was for C equals 1.5 and for different values of N. And you see that the uh, hyperplanes shift around a bit. So for example, this one here uh, moves to the upper right again and again. And in the limit for N to infinity, this would all, these three here would intersect in a single point. So we might have different pictures uh, for different values of N, which is really bad. But that's actually not the case. Uh, as you can see, uh, the pictures don't change qualitatively uh, by what I mean. So if we have this hyperplane here, uh, or this region here, which is uh, bounded by this hyperplane, this hyperplane, and this hyperplane, this region survives. It's here again, it just became smaller, and it's here again, just again, very small by now. But it's still... Uh, to the left and below of this hyperplane, which was this hyperplane here, it's to the right of this hyperplane here, and so on. And uh, this wouldn't work for any arbitrary uh, error term here. Here we really need to have some additional information about the error term, but um, um, it's nothing too special that we need. 
we just need uh, that the error term um, grows like a power. So it's basically just taking uh, one more term in the Taylor expansion, uh, which guarantees you that uh, the error term looks nice. Uh, so in the end, what this shows is that, again, by the same reasoning as above, um, we have here a polynomial growth in L for the uh, subword complexity of a periodic C uh, function applied to floor and to the C. And this might not be too... Uh, you might not be struck by this and say, oh, what a great result, but actually... Uh, we had a similar paper, again, with uh, Jean-Marc Desoyer, Michael Trimota, and Lukas Spiegelhofer uh, a few years ago, where we started this uh, problem here. And at a time, we were only able to show that uh, this subword complexity is not maximal, so that there are words that don't appear, which was already non-trivial. So this is, in some sense, really very nice, but also a bit surprising that we managed to get here. And now again, uh, we have to play the same game to uh, translate it to uh, synchronizing automatic sequences. Again, this time not completely trivial and there are a lot of technicalities, but I give you a rough idea of what's going on. So uh, we want to start the A of flow of M plus L to the C. And again, we use the Taylor expansion here. And the strategy, again, is to approximate A by a k to the lambda periodic function. And now we distinguish two different cases, uh, which can be done by this technical lemma here, uh, where the original idea for that is attributed to while. Um, I don't tell you exactly what's happening in this lemma. I just tell you what this lemma means for our situation. So for our situation, this lemma means that we can have uh, we have exactly one of the two cases. Either uh, this polynomial here uh, equidistributes really well modulo k to the lambda, or the coefficients of our polynomial are very close to rationals with a very small denominator. Uh, so again, we have to consider the two cases. And the first one is not very difficult because uh, the error term is small. And if uh, our polynomial here distributes really well and evenly in our interval, and we just shift it by a tiny amount every point, it's still rather well distributed, modulo k to the lambda. So the usual strategy just works immediately. So again, we approximate a by a k to the lambda periodic function. They don't agree. Uh, only when this expression is not synchronizing, which only happens rarely since they uh, distribute into residue classes very well. So in this case, we have again this polynomial bound. And in the second case, the coefficients of our polynomial are very close to rationals with small denominator. And it's a simple exercise to see that if we uh, split our interval zero up to L into arithmetic progressions with step size S, then uh, this means that we can approximate our uh, polynomial and therefore also our original function M plus L to the C with a polynomial with integer coefficients and small error terms. And then we recall that if we look at automatic sequences along polynomials with integer coefficients, then the subword complexity grows small, uh, slowly. And here again, we need that the error term doesn't destroy this. But in this case, it's really, we only need that the error term is small and that it uh, doesn't change the sign very often, which is really easy to see. OK, so uh, this brings me now to the end of the proof. I know there was quite a lot of hand waving going on in parts, but uh, I wanted to give you the rough ideas and the technical details. If you're really interested, you can find in the paper. So just as a conclusion, um, what you could take away from the talk. So synchronizing automatic sequences are in general quite a lot easier to treat than 
general automatic sequences. And here we have seen that uh, we can actually uh, work with uh, polynomials of any degree and also like n to the c, where c is any real number larger than zero compared to what we can do for say the Thu Moore sequence where we are now uh, limited at the moment by the technology that we have uh, to just look at uh, degrees two, maybe three. However, uh, when we want to talk about uh, questions involving subword complexity, this can still be really difficult. And the main reason for that is that for synchronizing automatic sequences, uh, the usual strategy is to uh, approximate them uh, with high density by some periodic sequence. But if something goes wrong on the part where they are not, uh, where they differ, uh, and they are some subword appears, that's already everything that could destroy subword complexity because there we only care about what's happening at least once. And as a open problem that seems very natural and I would be highly interested in seeing if something could be done here. So from what we've proven is that the uh, separate complexity for uh, synchronizing automatic sequences grows sub-exponentially. I mean, we know a little bit more here, but uh, maybe, so I don't expect this to be actually optimal, this upper bound, or it would hope that it is not optimal. Um, so can we do any better? And if I'm very optimistic, one might even hope for polynomial, but uh, would definitely need new ideas. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a really nice talk. Um, does anyone have any questions for Clemens? Any lower bounds known at all? Uh, yes. Um, so depends for what exactly. Uh, for the for n to the c uh, along uh, so periodic function uh, along n to the c there are lower bounds known, and it's basically uh, just uh, the number of cells that we have here. All of them appear actually. So here, uh, that's uh, pretty uh, good. Um, in the other cases, I'm not so sure, to be honest. I would need some time to think about that. OK, thanks. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. And uh, I have a question about uh, uh, polynomial sub complexity. So, you know that uh, in the original sub uh, complexity of words, uh, sequences, if uh, the Pn is at most n for some n, then it's periodic, as you know. Yes. So, so is there some analogy for polynomial subword complexity? Um, not that I know of. I mean, of course, again, if the polynomial subword complexity is at most n, then it needs to be periodic. Uh, but also, I mean, since we already know that uh, there are some for which uh, sequences that are not periodic, that for which the at least the arithmetic subword complexity only grows linearly. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure if we can say anything different. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, are there any other questions? Um, no, if not, um, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Clemens. Um, thank you everyone um, for attending the talk today. Uh, our next talk will be uh, in two weeks. And I think it's uh, Jakob, Jakob Konieczny.
so thanks everyone and uh, I'll see you again uh, in two weeks.